I bought a 2017 Volkswagen Golf R that apparently nobody wanted. I placed one bid at auction and just like that, I had won the car. New bidder. Come on, come on, come on, make it easy on me. In my last video, I took delivery of my new, slightly used 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. I had it transported all the way from Georgia to Florida because Georgia allows the public to bid on salvage cars, which Florida doesn't. The problem is after finally seeing the car in person, there seems to be a bit more damage than I had originally anticipated. The front headlight is completely destroyed. The bumper, the fender, and hood need to be replaced. Practically all the airbags are deployed and even the rear tailgate needs replacing but I knew all of that from the photos when I bid on the car. The problem, however, is what the photos don't show. The back of the car is so much more pushed in than I had thought, there is a mysterious coolant leak, and the battery is completely dead. So after reading all your guys' comments, I've come up with a pretty solid game plan in regards to where I'll begin working on this car. The first priority is going to be getting this car up and running and actually starting the engine, which involves me fixing this coolant uh, adapter leak, this broken coolant hose right here, and then we'll pretty much see if it can start and run. Then I'll put coolant in the car here and see if everything starts up and runs smoothly. Once the coolant leak is fixed and I'm able to drive the car around a little bit, I'm going to start working on the front end as I believe that's the easiest way to start, getting as many small victories as I can as I've literally never worked on a car or rebuilt a car before. This is going to include bending this back into shape, getting the fender off, fixing the bumper, putting a headlight in, as well as the adaptive cruise control. And that involves plastic welding this bumper, which we're gonna try to attack today. So now that we have a game plan, I've already went ahead and purchased that hose adapter for the coolant leak, which we're gonna try to install right now. But before I do, I just wanna mention that this channel is gonna be more about the finance aspect of rebuilding a car, the costs, the process, so on and so forth, which I'll be breaking down all the parts and prices in my next episode. But for the time being, I bought this part on eBay for only 40 bucks, which isn't really a bad price. Now the process of installing this coolant adapter is a bit easier said than done. Since it's kind of tucked below the cold air intake, I decided it would be in my best interest to remove this first. I grabbed my biggest pair of pliers and wiggled the hose clamp off of the top of the box. Next, I grabbed a screwdriver to help me loosen the vacuum line off the back of the intake. Once removed, you can merely shimmy out the intake box and create enough room to access the coolant adapter. I figured now would also be a better time than ever to clean up the shattered headlight from the engine bay as there is a lot more space to work with. Once I got the area cleaned up, it was time to attack this coolant adapter. I removed the first clamp with a pair of pliers by getting the hose clamp off first and pulling away. Then I removed the biggest coolant hose, which was the same process. I also needed to use a screw screwdriver for this to separate the two pieces since it was stuck to the adapter. And lastly, I separated the clip with a screwdriver which was holding the adapter to the actual radiator. Once off, it was time to install the new one, which simply means repeating everything in reverse, making sure to put the clamps back, and it was good as new. Oh, and I also remembered to remove the old broken plastic from inside the coolant hose before putting it back on the new one. I ran into a bit of trouble trying to slide this onto the new adapter, so I used a little bit of WD-40 to make this process a bit easier. So since the original air box was damaged in the accident, as you can see, there's a big hole through here where it's not supposed to be, I decided I might as well upgrade it since the price of one of these OEM is the same price as an aftermarket one. So I went ahead and purchased an APR cold air intake, which should hopefully not only make it sound better, potentially add a little bit more horsepower with the right tune, but also it looks freaking dope. Installing this cold air intake is extremely straightforward. I just pushed it back into the turbo inlet pipe, connected the vacuum line back to the back of the intake, and then made sure that the intake was sitting properly. Next, I just put the hose clamp back into the right spot, and just like that, I had officially installed a cold air intake. Something tells me this will probably be the easiest repair of this rebuild, so with that in mind, I'm enjoying the small victories while I still can. I also made sure to 
to tighten down the cold air intake so that it won't fall off while I'm driving the car. All right, so with the new coolant adapter installed over here and that we put back a new non-broken cold air intake, I should be able to have a closed system now for coolant. So when I pour the coolant in, it hopefully, fingers crossed, should not leak. Another thing I did notice about the car that I was fiddling with a little bit here is the fact that this coolant line is kind of rubbing against this ever so slightly. And then I noticed that there is some broken tabs over here. So I'm gonna have to look up this part number and replace it, but I'm not gonna mess with this until I take the bumper off and actually see what else is damaged. So here's a question for all you Volkswagen drivers out there. I have heard mixed opinions about removing the silica bag from your coolant reservoir. Now, since I've heard horror stories about it ripping and destroying your coolant system, I decided to remove it now since the reservoir was empty. But let me know if that was a good idea down in the comments below. And if I'm wrong to remove it, then I can always put it back in. Now, after removing the silica bag, it was time to top off the car with coolant. I had some leftover G13 OAT coolant from my Audi RS3, so I used the rest of it to top off off the car. And a trick I learned is to squeeze the coolant hose behind the radiator a few times to let some of the air out of the system. You'll know it's working when you start to see air bubbles come up from your coolant reservoir. So I just poured some coolant into it and it seems like it really didn't take all that much, which fingers crossed means there wasn't that much coolant that spilled up just a little bit from the top here, but I am gonna start the car and see once it cycles through and the thermostat opens, if it will suck more of the coolant down with it. And then as it does that, I'm gonna to top it off. Now this is the officially second time that I'm gonna be starting this car since I got it. One was taking it off the ramp and this is gonna be like officially the first start. So fingers crossed and let's hope that it actually starts up. Funny enough, I didn't even have time to start the car before I noticed that the coolant tank was already empty, which means that air is getting circulated through it. Now I did check under the car. I don't see any leaks. So hopefully we do have a closed system. Now, prior to buying the car, I did have somebody inspect it and they did check the dipstick to see if the oil was milky and it wasn't. It's actually at a perfect oil level and not milky at all. So I feel confident running the car. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is before I even started working on the car, I did check the battery in preparation for getting the car up and running later on in the day. When I checked my battery, it was showing 0.89, which is incredibly low for an AGM battery. I even bought this Vi Viking fully automatic uh, microprocessor controlled battery charger from Harbor Freight to hopefully charge it up over a couple of hours and it was coming up as it was completely dead. So I'm just deciding to replace it entirely as it is the original battery from when the car was manufactured about seven years ago. So it's probably a good time to replace it anyway. Replacing a car battery might be one of the easiest things you can do on your car. You simply disconnect the terminals, take off the leads, and in this instance, unscrew the lower plate that holds the battery snug. Now, being that this is fairly straightforward, I want to take the time to explain what happens when you let your car battery sit uncharged over a long period of time, like this Volkswagen Golf R did when it was in the Copart yard. Given I'm sure it had its accessory lights on when it sat for over a month in the yard, it completely drained the battery. Now, some might say that this battery was savable, but I'd rather not take the chance on a seven-year-old battery. When a battery like this sits over a long period of time at a low voltage, a process called sulfation starts to take place. This is the formation of buildup or lead sulfate crystals on the surface and in the pores of the active material of the battery's lead plates, which usually causes permanent damage if left uncharged for a long period of time. Once I had the battery installed, it was time to coat it to the car. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is take the OBD11 and plug it into the OBD reader at the bottom left-hand side of your dash. Once plugged in, navigate to the app on your phone and then just turn the battery on the car. Now that it's in, all we do is just click connect right here and we should start populating everything. We click the Bluetooth, it'll start connecting to the car and it should automatically detect a vehicle or you might have to enter a VIN really quick. But now it's already reading the control units as you can see here, hopefully. Now, while this is happening, we're probably gonna see all the fault codes on this and I wouldn't be surprised if we see over 100 because of the amount of things that are unplugged or damaged on this car. So as the computer scans the car and I start to see all the fault codes, it quickly reminded me that I have quite the project on my hands. And it's times like this that I remind myself that it's good to step out of my comfort 
comfort zone and try new things. Yes, it might seem overwhelming at first, but if I break it down into smaller projects, the small victories will hopefully continue to motivate me and push me through until it's complete. Anyways, once the system scan is complete, I clicked on gateway, then adaptation, and then battery adaptation. Then it was time to just enter the battery capacity, manufacturer, serial number, and type in the type of battery, which is AGM. Then I just slide right and it coded it to the computer. Without this little tool right here, this project would be pretty much impossible and I wouldn't be able to read any of the codes and be able to perform pretty much any of the maintenance on this car. I actually bought this for my RS3 and the cool thing about the OBD11 is it works for Volkswagen, Audi, Skoda, and a lot of other European brands. So if you haven't got one of these, consider this the holy grail for owning any sort of European car and make sure to pick one up down in the description below where you can help support the channel. The best part is these things are relatively cheap, about 60 or $70. It can also read cars like BMW, Mini Cooper, Bentley, and even Lamborghini. Now what makes this device so unique is it gives you features that usually only dealers have, such as scanning, reading, and even clearing various fault codes on your car, allowing you to ease the process of maintaining your car with only a few clicks on your phone. You can even enable, disable, and change the configuration of various features and functions in your car, even some hidden settings that I bet you never knew you had. And the best part is this gives you access to resetting your control unit, doing diagnostic service changes, and even coding your car like I did with the battery. Oh, moment of truth, I have the key right here. I'm gonna start the car with the coolant tank open and see if that can start flushing out some of the coolant and potentially lower it. Now, this is the first time I've started this in a long time, so I guess wish me luck. Wow, start it up easy. Sounds great too. Cars in park. We have a few things on the dash. No coolant leak though, I don't think. But it does sound like it's running. The fans are on, good sign. Coolant looks okay, lights are on. Hopefully these fans die down because it does sound a bit too loud. It doesn't seem like it needs to be running that fast. All right, so we might have another problem on our hands and I just took a quick break because I was freaking out a little bit um, and I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, but uh, I just want to show you really quick what's happening with the car when I turned it on. All right, so I put the coolant in the car. Everything seems to be holding coolant. Uh, there's no leaks that I can see so far. Granted, I didn't take the bumper off. And if you can check right here, you can see we do have coolant in the car. It's at the min line, which seems to be fine. Um, I'm gonna top it off a little bit more. Granted, I only ran the car for a minute and it sounded good. It sounded really good, but there seems to be a problem which made my heart drop. All right, so look what happens when I start the car. Watch the needle on the gauge here. As you can see, that's not good. It's. That's almost at zero RPMs. The engine sounds on though, and this made my heart sink. We're at zero RPMs, but the car is on. It doesn't make sense. The engine is still hot, the coolant is still hot, the temperatures, everything is good. But look, we're at zero RPMs. As you heard, the engine sounds pretty much normal, and there's really not enough damage to the front that I would think the engine is fine. And this car is bone stock, so, What's interesting to me is why would the RPMs go all the way down to zero when the engine sounds like it's on? Another interesting thing, granted, I'm not entirely sure about this, but the fans kick on almost immediately and they stay on for quite a long time. Now, that could be because I changed the battery on the car and things need to be reset, or because I haven't waited long enough for the fans to bog back down. And I also haven't checked any of the codes on the computer, so I don't know necessarily just yet, but I'm just nervous as hell as to why I'm getting zero RPMs. So here I am thinking that I bought lemon and the engine is actually dead and I got screwed getting the car inspected by a third party but I think I just found out what the problem actually is and feel free to let me know in the comments down below if this has ever happened to you. All right so watch what happens when I turn the engine off. Watch the needle on the gauge. So already turning it off in three two one. Look at that. That seems to be the problem. It seems like the needle is out of calibration because I don't think the needle should be resting less than zero. Notice here, the, all, all the other gauges seem to be at zero correctly, except for the RPM reading, which tells me 
this is off and it almost seems like it's off about 1000 RPMs. So I'm not a betting man, but I think that's the problem. I have a gut feeling that the needle is out of calibration and it should be a little bit higher. Now, I don't know how to fix that. Hopefully I can move the gauge, the needle ever so slightly and that might solve the problem, but uh, let me know down in the comments what you think. So moving on to something that won't give me a mini heart attack, I think I'm going to change course and try to fix this adaptive cruise control module. Now, luckily during the accident, it didn't actually break this wiring harness, which would have been a huge setback trying to find one of these because this isn't sold separate. It's connected to the whole like bumper of the car. Now what's interesting is it actually snapped off the old piece right here and I should be able to just wiggle this out Yep, just like that. And you can see, this is the old piece from the uh, adaptive cruise control sensor. What's crazy is Volkswagen sells that adaptive cruise control sensor for over $900. Crazier is that same sensor is not only on the uh, Volkswagen Golf R, it's the same exact thing on my Audi RS3. The process of installing the adaptive cruise control sensor is extremely easy. Now, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that that's it and all I have to do in regards to this system once I reset the computer. Otherwise, there's a really good chance this will probably have to be calibrated in a later time but I'm hoping I won't have to do that since only the sensor was knocked out of place the actual bracket and the alignment seems to be perfect from how it was factory I was also able to pick up the cover which goes neatly over the top of the sensor to make it look a little bit better as I think it serves no other purpose with the car finally in driving condition I felt comfortable enough to start moving it around under its own power in preparation to remove the front bumper with a little help from my dad we were able to get the car up on some ramps this is to give me enough clearance under the car to remove the screws holding the bumper to the actual car. Now, since I'm sure there will be wires needing to be disconnected, I decided to unplug the battery first, just to make sure I don't short anything out. Next, it was time to remove the broken front grille by removing a few torque screws. Then I could simply pull it away. Next, there are approximately four torque screws in the wheel well, which need to be taken off on both sides. And lastly, there are a bunch more torque screws underneath the car. Next, I unplugged the wiring harness, and when I was confident enough that I had all the screws out, I gave each side of the bumper a tug and it popped right off. The last step in the removal process was figuring out how to take the headlight washer hose out without spilling the wiper fluid everywhere. It took me a few minutes, but then I realized the easiest method was to just drain it from one side and then the other, and then just hang the hose on the car once I removed the whole thing from the bumper. And just like that, the bumper was free and finally out of the way. Then it was time to clean up my mess from all the headlight leftover coolant and wiper fluid all over the floor. All right, guys, so bumper is officially off the car. It was a bit of a pain in the butt trying to figure out where to disconnect the washer fluid bottle. I decided to just unravel it and shove it in the corner right over here, just because it was easier to disconnect it from the front end of the bumper than to go and shimmy under the car and disconnect it there and have it drain everywhere. So as you saw, it was pretty simple and probably the way I recommend taking a full bumper off. But let me just show you super quick what the front bumper looks like and the damage that we're gonna have to fix and hopefully be able to plastic weld. All right, so all in all, the bumper really doesn't look all that bad. I really don't see much damage on here. There's a few things we're gonna have to try to bend back into place, but nothing looks cracked or really broken that needs to be replaced. The only thing that needs to be fixed on this though is right here. So we're gonna have to bend these back in, push these back in, and hopefully be able to plastic weld this, sand it down, and then put some primer on it and get it ready for paint. But that's the only thing I noticed broken on this car, which is exciting because that means I get to save the whole bumper. So very happy. We'll do that in another video. All right, guys, that's gonna wrap up today's video. We made a lot of progress on the Volkswagen Golf R. There's quite a lot more stuff that has to be done as well as there's a few more things I found broken on the car that I'm gonna to have to order. Potentially a radiator support panel, uh, but we'll, or the radiator support, but uh, lots more to come. If you're liking these episodes on the Rebuild series, definitely make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Ooh, <laughs> ooh,